Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library. I'm Dama Tamanawala. You know my co-host Garrett McGilvery, and today we are joined by Dennis Mitchell, who is the CEO of Starlight Capital. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Dama. Thanks. Good to see you, Garrett. It's <laughs> always a fun part. Uh, so, uh, before we dive into Starlight Capital and all the interesting things that you guys are doing, uh, can you provide us with a little bit of context? Um, you know, Starlight is. Uh, Starlight Capital is a relatively new organization, but let's back up. How did you, how did your career kind of begin, and how did you get to where you are right now? Okay, um, well, I you know undergrad in business from Laurier, the greatest business school in the world, <laughs> and uh, okay, <laughs> and uh, I started off in the branch network at Scotia Bank as a financial advisor, and uh, one day uh, Warren Buffett announced his holdings in Coke, something like that. And I had remembered the name from undergrad in my investments course. And so I, I purchased a book uh, on the way home. It was called Buffetology. And I read it cover to cover uh, that night. And it uh, sparked a passion in me for money management. And so I, I spent uh, a couple of years going downtown to see the guys at Scotia Castles to pick their brains and show them one pagers and three pagers and five pagers. And I uh, wrote a couple levels of CFA and left to do my MBA, and that got me into a role at RBC in a rotational program, which finally led to a role at Century Investments, where I spent 10 and a half years rising from research analyst to EVP and CIO. Um, after a brief stint at Sprott, I reconnected with Daniel Drimmer, who of course founded Starlight Investments and its predecessor firms, and we agreed to found Starlight Capital together. Wow. And what was your what, what was your like founding mission when you started that company? Like, what was your guys' goal to do? Great question. Yeah, great question. So, um, I think the last thing that the Canadian capital markets needs is a, another asset management firm. So mm-hmm. naturally, we started an asset management firm. <laughs> but uh, what we thought we could bring to the universe that was unique and different was first a focus on performance uh, and a focus on alternative asset classes that we felt were underrepresented in clients' portfolios where we thought we could bring unique expertise, superior performance, and really earn a place um, on advisors' shelves and in clients' portfolios. And uh, the fact that Starlight Investments is a direct real estate investment firm really gives us a competitive advantage in Mm -hmm. that we get to see where large pools of capital are going with their money before everybody else kind of sees the headline or the press release. You know, so we've got great relationships with large institutional investors. If you go through Starlight Investments website, you can see all the press releases for all the large pension plans and institutional investors that we deal with. And that relationship is something that we truly value and uh, is a huge competitive advantage for Starlight Capital as we invest capital. Okay. From, from what I understand, you guys have two main funds, the one being real estate and then the other one being infrastructure, correct? Uh, that's partially correct. Okay. So we what? have we have uh, our real estate. <laughs> no, we have our, yeah. no. no. <laughs> well, we have our real estate fund, which is global in nature. Yeah. Um, we launched an ETF series of that fund as well, so clients can access it through an e- a listed ETF or through a traditional mutual fund, and it is the exact same portfolio. So a dollar in one side drops into the same portfolio. Mm. A dollar in the other side drops into the same portfolio. We did so- we did the exact same thing with our infrastructure solution. So mm-hmm. that is again another global solution. Um, And then the third solution that we launched last year was is actually the Starlight Hybrid Global Real Mm -hmm. Assets Trust. Mm -hmm. And that is an extremely unique solution in that it provides investors with exposure to both listed real estate and infrastructure solutions, but also unlisted private direct real estate and infrastructure solutions. And so it was an obvious partnership that we struck with our parent company, Starlight Investments, and that provides us the exposure to direct private real estate investments. And then we've got a strategic alliance with Fiera, um, specifically their infrastructure business, that gives us access to private direct infrastructure investments. So it's 50-50 real estate and infrastructure and 60-40 Pri- sorry, listed securities being the 60% and mm. the 40% being private. And there really is nothing like it in the Canadian universe. So back to our primary mission, we f- we saw that gap and we saw that opportunity and we saw an, uh, an ability to provide a solution that doesn't exist, but has value to a client's portfolio. And the response has been very, very favorable. There's nothing like, uh, they say imitation is a sincerest form of flattery. We received a number of calls and there are a number of people out there trying to replicate what we've created. Um, we'll see how successful they are, but we're very proud of the hybrid trust in particular. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. I know, I know certainly on the apartment side, there's a lot of people trying to follow Starlight. It is <laughs> not as, not as easy as it looks. Uh, so 
Well, uh, if you're going to follow in Daniel Drimmer's footsteps, you're going to need 24 years um, because Daniel's been in this marketplace for going on 25 years and he's been tremendously successful. But uh, above and beyond generating you know, 25% IRR since 2011 across $20 billion of transactions, it's the relationships that he's forged and uh, it is the trust that he has earned. You know, if you're going to be a, a big player in multifamily real estate in particular, you know, that's people's homes where they live. Mm. You're going to touch upon, you know, politicians at the municipal level, the provincial level, the federal level. You've got to have established relationships. You've got to have a track record and you've got to be able to deliver both do what you say, but also come in on budget and also not disturb the natural ecosystem of where people live, work and play. So if you're going to follow in his footsteps, it's going to take you 25 years to catch up. And in the meantime, we get to enjoy the benefits of all of his hard work and all of his dedication and all of his success. Mm -hmm. wow. Better apartment yeah. units to live in. Yeah. <laughs> Are you guys acting as the capital for Starlight Investments as well, like the capital source? I'm just I'm a little fuzzy on the whole idea. Sure. So, so why don't I take you a step back? When you look at Starlight Investments, our parent company, there's four businesses. Now, we started Starlight Capital last year, so I'll talk about the first three businesses that existed. Um, Starlight Investments in total is, call it $11 billion of capital. Uh, the largest business is our Canadian multifamily business. Right. So we have about 24,000 apartments across Canada. Uh, that business is about $5.5 billion of capital. Uh, we have a lot of institutional partners there, but we also have some family office, some high net worth investors. Mm. We've also got uh, investors overseas. Uh, so that is a very big business. It's sort of the fundamental flagship business at Starlight Investments. The next biggest businesses are U.S. multifamily business, and we've got about 13,000 apartments across the Sunshine Belt of the United States. So think Texas, Colorado, Florida, Arizona, Nevada. Um, you know, we recently did a very large transaction with Tricon Capital where we sold them right. 7,000 apartment buildings. So that was the amalgamation of five different sort of retail funds that we had launched since 2013. We combined them and then as that final fund five was coming up to maturity, we found an exit that involved trans, you know, selling the portfolio to Tricon Capital. So investors realized anywhere from say an 11 or 28% IRR, depending on their holding period, you know, 11 for the shorter, you know, shorter hold periods mm -hmm. and 28 for the longer hold mm -hmm. periods. And then our third business is our commercial business. And that business is largely in True North commercial REIT. Uh, but that business is about, uh, call it $2 billion of capital. And it is 6 million square feet of commercial real estate, mainly a uh, suburban office, just like our head office at uh, Bloor and Islington. Um, you know, that portfolio, as I said, is mainly contained in True North Commercial REIT. Uh, fantastic portfolio and has had exceptional returns year to date in particular. And so those are the traditional solutions that Starlight Investments has offered. Direct private investments, mainly targeted at institutions, high net worth, family offices, and a little bit of retail penetration. What Starlight Capital brings is the ability to sort of complete a number of spectrums, if you will. So now we've got a platform that is dedicated to the retail channel. So when you talk about raising capital from different sources, mm -hmm. you've got institutions, high net worth, family office, and now a dedicated retail channel. Uh, when you're talking about the solutions you can provide, you can go with 100% private solutions to 100% listed solutions and everything in between. So it's really reminiscent of somebody like Brookfield where they can raise capital wherever it makes the most sense, right? Europe, Asia, um, United States, Canada, equity, preferred equity, debt. You know, at Starlight Investments, we've now built that platform where we can raise capital from different channels and we can provide solutions with varying levels of risk return and exposure. Hmm. Okay. All right. You, it's, yeah. I gotta, uh, you're my role model. I gotta be like you. I mean, that's an articulate answer. Um, so, okay, so one thing I wanted to ask, we briefly touched on Minto, but what are some of the companies that you're most interested today? And uh, what are some of the asset cl classes that are maybe undervalued or underrepresented in investments today? Sure. So I'll talk real estate and then I'll talk infrastructure. Okay. So on the real estate side of things, what we've seen via our relationship with Starlight Investments is that uh, investors are really focused on two sectors in particular, and we call them beds and sheds, you know, apartments and industrial. And uh, in a number of geographies, but Canada is a great example of this, you've got tremendous demand for new accommodations, but you, you don't have the supply response. And so you've seen rising rents, you've seen repurpose 
multi, sorry, mixed use developments spring up. And the goal here is to just create more accommodation and housing for the ever growing population of this country. Mm -hmm. And we tend to be congregated in the big six markets, right? Everybody seems to have a vetcom strategy, Vancouver, Edmonton, Toronto, Calgary, Ottawa, Montreal. And so those big six markets continue to take on a disproportionate amount of new graduates, of immigrants. So as the population swells, it's those six markets where the housing shortage is really the most acute. And uh, you know the best example of that is Vancouver, where home prices have appreciated dramatically to the point where affordability is almost non-existent. You know, the solution there is more homes, more apartments. And so Starlight is very active in that market in particular. Hmm. Now on the industrial side of things, what you've got is the rise of e-commerce. So I think we've all heard about the death of the mall, right? And yeah. you know, the, the western part of Toronto, call it Etobicoke, is a perfect example of this, where 15 years ago you had three malls that sort of jockeyed for position. You had Sherway Gardens, you had Cloverdale Mall, you had Honeydale Mall. Well, you know, fast forward to today, uh, Sherway Gardens has clearly distanced itself from the other malls. It's gone upscale. There's a Tesla, an Apple, right? You've got a Nordstrom's, a mm -hmm. Saks. They're really catering to sort of a, a higher stratosphere, if you will, of spend. On the other end of the spectrum, Cloverdale Mall has taken a step, I don't want to say down or back, but they've gone to fill sort of more a value retailing sort of niche. You know, so there's a bulk bar in there. There's a kitchen stuff plus, right. you know. And so, you know, the value retailer, the value consumer is more shopping and gravitating towards that mm -hmm. mall. And Honeydale Mall is now shuttered, right? So yeah, as you've seen the evolution of retail and, cons and the consumer's tastes and interests, the malls in that market have adjusted. And you've gone from three sort of in the middle of the pack to two at the polar opposites. And the third is, is died a slow death. Now, you know, the consumer's tastes and their demand for ever quicker fulfillment when it comes to shopping has led to the rise of e-commerce. And it won't spell the end of the mall. You know, people will still want to go into the malls and try on clothes. And malls are evolving to provide a more experiential shopping experience, right? More right. high-end restaurants, gyms, movie theaters. Uh, but, you know, I'm never an early adopter. But last year was the first year where I did all of my Christmas shopping on Amazon. Right. So wow. as you know, as bricks and mortars retailers now evolve, you've got Walmart buying jet.com, you've got Costco embracing an online model. A lot of the traditional online retailers have now started to open up bricks and mortar. So I think the winning strategy will be some sort of hybrid. But what this how this ties back to industrial real estate is that as online shopping increases, as more of us are shopping online, the need for logistics and fulfillment centers closer and closer to the end market just goes up. And so what you've seen in Canada in particular is where industrial rents were pretty much stagnant at $5 a square foot for the first 10 years of my career. In the last three or four years, they've taken off and pretty much doubled and tripled in this country. And uh, Prologis Reed is a great example of the evolution of that model, where they're now building two and three story industrial logistics facilities right in the end market. Like they're... I forget the name of the asset, uh, but their crossings asset in Seattle is right in near the downtown core, but still close to the Seattle ports. Right. And it's so that they can fulfill on Amazon's commitment of next day fulfillment, same day fulfillment. So that's the evolution of industrial and it's really creating upside in rents, in values, and you've seen the industrial REITs outperform globally. So whether it's Prologis in the US, Tritax in the UK, whether it's GLP in Singapore, you've really seen the industrial REITs generate very strong returns. Wow. Do you, do you think we're going to start seeing that multi-story industrial in Canada at some point soon? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it'll be a challenge in the vetcom markets because they are so dense and so urban focused, but mm -hmm. never underestimate the creativity of, uh, of real estate guys, right? right? So I do think you will see that sort of multi-story, multi-bay. You know, that asset in particular in Seattle is able to service tractor trailers on two different levels. So it's really an enormous asset, but in a very, very attractive market. Right. So I think you'll see them roll that strategy out across North America and into Europe and Asia as well. Wow. Do you think that um, certain technology like self-driving cars and, and obviously self-driving tractor trailers and stuff like that is going to have a major impact on industrial markets? I do. Uh, I think technology is one of the, I think industrial real estate is one of those markets where, or one of those real estate sectors where technology can really be put to bear. So you're seeing that in the evolution of these assets themselves. I think when people think of industrial, they think of old, you know, old warehouses, dark and dingy, yeah. out in parts of the town, the city you want to avoid. Really the new industrial asset is one that is very modern, high ceilings, bright, airy computers, robots, wide bays so that robots can go back and forth, 
very high stacking because you've got robots and the the people working in those facilities are increasingly going to have to be engineering mm -hmm. oriented right mm -hmm. so that is going to be a high paying job um, but you're going to see a turnover and you're going to see an evolution in the type of people who work in warehouse facilities as technology makes its impact on industrial real estate in particular so i'm, I'm excited by that because it, it, it you know it creates a new level of return and risk for buying these types of assets it creates a new strat stratus if you will um, in terms of are you buying traditional industrial real estate in some types of REITs and real estate companies or are you buying more modern facilities like Prologis would offer or, or Duke Realty for that matter. So it just gives us the ability to add value through stock selection and fundamental due diligence as right. opposed to just simply saying we're allocating to industrial. Right. Okay. So technology ends up being a component of your investment thesis when you're actually investing in... Absolutely. And it's another way that businesses differentiate the service that they offer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you guys do you guys go into any specific niche, niches like uh, you know we've we've talked about data centers on this platform before sure. um, you know cannabis focused uh, industrial operators are there is there anything that you're kind of exploring uh, any s specific verticals that you're looking into like that. Yeah, so we tend not to look specifically at verticals. I know that sounds funny after having just said multifamily right. and industrial. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> what we're really looking for is individual companies, right? Okay. And so we really like some of the data center companies. We really like some of the tower companies. We, uh, we But then again, I, I can give you a niche company like Americold, um, where Americold is focused on cold storage facilities across you know, mm -hmm. the United States and across into Europe now. Right. Um, that is a specialized niche type of industrial real estate, if you will. There's, again, when you talk about data centers, when you talk about sort of uh, life sciences space, there's a, a higher price point when it comes to building per square foot, right? right? There's a specialized expertise that comes with managing a facility like that. Well, cold storage is very similar. You're part of the value chain for department, sorry, for grocery stores, for restaurants, and so you're part of their critical infrastructure. Uh, and the assets themselves are not just cold shell industrial assets. You know, there's reinforced floors, there's drop ceilings, there's more electronics, there's more computing that goes into it. Right. And where those assets are located Located, obviously they need to be located closer to entertainment hubs right so that type of asset and that type of company also appeals to us because again it's just more ability for that company to differentiate itself or to justify charging premium rents for it to increase the retention rate of its tenants and just to drive more sustainable consistent cash flow growth over the long term so we are interested in some of these technology-oriented real estate plays, whether it be cold storage, data centers, cell towers. But again, I come back to it's a diversified portfolio that we run. So oftentimes you'll find that we own pretty boring office names and uh, multifamily names as mm -hmm. well. Uh, it's not to say that they can't compound capital at high rates of return, yeah. especially when people are chasing after shiny objects like Bitcoin yeah. or <laughs> cannabis. Yeah. That creates a tremendous opportunity in just your boring mom and pop REITs as well. Yeah. Right. So just circling back to the beds part of your, the bed and shed sure. analogy, um, what are your thoughts on, on co-living as sort of a, a new thing that's, that's coming into the multifamily market? It's in Europe right now. I think there's, uh, uh, who's doing one in Ottawa? Um, Oxford? Uh, no, Dream. Dream is doing Dream. one. In a component of their yeah, a component of their building is going to be yeah. there, and then I know there's a few in the United States, um, yeah. Commons stuff like that. What, what are your thoughts Medici. on this? Medici living process? group. Well, Medici's one other one. There's another one called Commons, I believe. Okay. Yeah. So I I think again, you always want to have a diversified tenant roster such that you're not you don't have over, you're not overly exposed to anyone say employer or any one industry or any one demographic and so I look at co-living as just another way of diversifying your tenant roster. Now in this case I would argue that most of the people who are engaging in a co-living sort of arrangement may be younger, just getting their career started, mm -hmm. they want to enjoy a standard of living that maybe isn't achievable on their own at their current level of employment, mm -hmm. maybe people who are a little older who are going through some sort of transition period. All of this to say that, you know, if you take this analogy and apply it to the office space, you get WeWork or mm -hmm. Regis, right? right? So I think that those can be interesting. Hopefully Regis. Yeah. <laughs> those can be interesting. They can be a small component of your occupancy, whether it be an office or in multifamily. But I don't think you're going to want to make a massive commitment to that space because by definition, it isn't the strongest tenant base and it is even more transient than usual, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if the average turnover in an apartment building is 40, 50%, then I would imagine if you 
you've got co-living arrangements, you know, nobody grows up and says, I want to live with four strangers or four of my buddies forever. <laughs> right. So I would think the turnover would be even higher. Not, the, not normal people. Yeah. <laughs> Generally, it's not normally the baseline. <laughs> so I think you'd have even higher turnover. And so that would drive up your operating costs, your SG&A, and uh, probably isn't the greatest tenant roster to have in any one asset. So is there a space for it? Sure. But I don't think any institutional or, or investment grade sort of acquirer and aggregator of real estate is going to want that to be a big chunk of their client base and their exposure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and from what I understand, you guys invest, uh, like obviously Canada, America, and Europe as well. Uh, no, Starlight Investments is constrained to, to North America. If Sorry, you're talking about Starlight Capital, yeah, that, yes, yes, we've got a glo we've got several global <laughs> mandates. Okay, and then when you when you look at Europe, for example, because Canada and America are a little more understandable for our viewers, but is there a difference in terms of what you're looking for in terms of like multifamily companies that are there? Like, do they operate differently? Is there any different? Again, Europe's a yeah. little more foreign for us. Ab absolutely. So whenever you're investing globally, the, the first thing you've got, uh, you've got to identify sort of your key success factors across any sort of investment thesis, right? So if you're looking at multifamily, always you're looking for, um, you know, demand outstripping supply in some sustainable manner. Um, and then after that, you've got to understand your ability as a landlord to be able to drive rent growth, to be able to invest in the assets, to justify higher rent growth, your ability to capitalize the asset, and then your ability to you know, dispose of the asset and repatriate capital if necessary. Mm -hmm. So when you're examining these foreign markets, the first thing you're looking for is attractive supply demand metrics. Then you're looking at sort of the regulatory environment. Is it, uh, is it a rent control environment like we have in several provinces in this country, or is it a completely market-based system? Uh, what are the customs? Is the average home ownership in that country 70% or is it 20%? Uh, is there a prestige to owning a home like the American dream? Or are people perfectly comfortable to live a higher standard of living in rented accommodation? Uh, and then it comes down to how, do these, how are these assets capitalized? You know, in North America, we tend to have longer debt terms and match it up with longer lease terms. In Europe, they tend to have shorter lease terms and they tend to have variable rate debt that they hedge out a couple of years. So it's really understanding those dynamics and what that spells to you in terms of an IRR and whether that's acceptable to you when you risk adjust. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're looking at Europe, you know, we find markets like the Netherlands, like Ireland, like the UK, like Germany, that are very attractive on a number of those boxes. And when we find companies there, we find that they tend to compound capital at higher rates of return than say similar companies in Spain or Italy or Portugal would. So first you're looking for the key success factors, mm -hmm. then you're trying to understand the market, then you're trying to find businesses that give you the exposure that you want and will allow you to compound capital at the rate that you're comfortable with. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> you, I, I think we still have uh, infrastructure to chat about. So when we're looking at infrastructure, first off, um, Canada is a market with a ton of infrastructure, but generally confined to one or two sectors of scale. Midstream in the energy space, so companies that occupy everything between finding the oil and gas or the energy resource and distributing the energy resource to the end market. Right. Those companies that are in between that sort of gather, process, strip it out, treat, uh, and then transport, those are attractive businesses and you can find lots of them in Canada. Uh, the second market is utilities, right? Whether it's water utilities, electricity utilities, or combo utilities, multi-line utilities, if you will. But when you start talking about other types of infrastructure, like bridges, ports, airports, toll roads, data centers, towers, you don't find a lot of that exposure within Canada. And when you do, it usually comes as part of a larger conglomerate. So SNC-Lavalin is a perfect example where people love it for its exposure to the 407, yet if you were to buy Ferrovial, which is a Spanish company, you'll find that they own 43% of the 407 and they actually manage the asset and the concession. Right? They own Heathrow Airport in London, one of the busiest and most attractive airports in the world. So. The Canadian market, I think, has long been underserved in types in terms of the breadth of infrastructure that's available. And again, this is why we launched a global infrastructure solution. There are very few of them out there in the market. Most of them tend to be managed across the three traditional infrastructure subsectors, industrial, energy, and utilities. We saw an opportunity to serve an under-addressed market with a global solution that expands the definition of infrastructure. So we've invested in as many as eight of the 11 gig sectors as opposed to just those three that I mentioned. Mm. And so that gives our investors exposure to things like global payments networks, stock exchanges, um, waste disposal and collection firms, 
um, you know, wood pellet firms, if you will, just, uh, you know, in, in addition to airports and toll roads that aren't available in the Canadian market. So by doing that and expanding that definition, we're giving people exposure to sectors that don't exist in Canada, that have compounded at a high rate of return, and that improve the efficiency of their portfolios over the long term. Wow. Out of those subsectors that you mentioned, which one would be the most, like, I'd say interesting and are emerging in terms of like the revolution of technology. Which, which one well, should Garrett invest in? Right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think data centers, <laughs> is one of, yeah, data centers is one of the best. Um, here's a crazy stat for you. 90% of all of the data that exists in the world today was created in the last two years. So it gives you an idea of wow. the sheer amount of data. Like we're creating it right now with this interview, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is going to be stored initially on a laptop, but if you send it into the cloud, it'll end up in a data center somewhere, right. right? Every time somebody views this, whether it's on LinkedIn or on your website, every time somebody likes something or Snapchats something, all of that data that gets created has to be stored somewhere. Think of financial services data that has to be stored for seven to 10 years, legal wow. data. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the demand for data centers and more storage just continues to grow and grow and grow. And so we look at companies like an Equinix or a Coresight or a Next DC as you know, traditional, as, as modern infrastructure as you will. They provide an essential service to a large portion of the population in a supply constrained manner. And that gives them infrastructure like characteristics and returns most importantly. So data centers is a great technology play in the infrastructure space that I think a lot of our peers have sort of neglected Wow. Okay. I know where I'm putting my money now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I actually, do you have another question in this Avenue or did, uh, I, I was honestly going to ask like, how, how do you know, I, I would find it difficult to know so much about so many different types of sectors because mm -hmm. like you're obviously leading infrastructure and you have to understand, like when you invest in a business, you have to understand right. that business. Like sure. you're understanding data centers and you're able to articulate it at a high level, but then also, you know, waste disposal and collection. How, how do you keep on the curve? So I think to do this job effectively, I think a lot of people assume that you have to be super smart and you have to be great with spreadsheets. Really to be successful at this job, you have to be patient, detail oriented, and you have to read, read, read. You have to have a natural curiosity. So I've always been very curious about how things work. You know, my mother will tell you stories about me taking things apart and not being as successful putting them back together. <laughs> but um, you've, you've got to have a natural curiosity and that's what lends itself to going out and researching and finding out about these industries. Um, you know, and I always tell my guys, you know, I believe in the doctrine of enough. You know, everybody says our people are the smartest. I want people who are smart enough. I want people who are hardworking enough. What I'm really looking for, though, is people who are very intellectually curious, people who are detail-oriented, people who are reliable. You know, the smarts and the, and the hardworking take care of themselves. Mm. And then I need people who are humble, hungry, and honest, right? People mm -hmm. who want to make their mark, leave a legacy, create something, and along the way be rewarded for that. So from my standpoint, when I look at my job, I actually think it's easier than a lot of other, a lot of my competitors. I, I'm looking at really real estate and infrastructure, and that takes me to eight of the 11 gig sectors, if you will. I don't spend a lot of time in consumer staples or precious metals or, mm. or um, healthcare, if you will. Um, so I look at a diversified portfolio manager, especially on a global basis, as really being you know an, an inch deep and several miles wide on, mm -hmm. on lots of different things. Right. I like our ability to really go deep. And the fact that we run concentrated portfolios, you know, our funds are 38 securities and 33 securities. You know, we may, the three of us may stay on top of maybe 150 total companies. You know, our ability to stay on top of those companies and the industries that they're in is far superior to somebody who's looking at 11 gig sectors across every you know country in the world and has got a portfolio of 200, 300 securities. I like our business and how it's structured. I think we've got a greater ability to be successful consistently using our approach. So it, it may sound, uh, and, and then, you know, I've got quite a bit of healthy gray in my, in my beard. So <laughs> we've been doing this for a long time. It's given us the ability to look at companies for five, seven, 10 years. So it brings that learning curve down when you're yeah. looking at new sectors or evolving industries like data centers or tower mm -hmm. REITs. Right. And, we just, we like what we do. And uh, if you enjoy what you do, you never work a day in your life. And we love what we do. That's awesome. For a while now, you know, we were just down at the, uh, or I was down at the apartment conference mm -hmm. uh, earlier. Oh my God, it's October. It was in September. Uh, but we had Benjamin Tal up there giving his opinion on the economy for, it seems like 10 years now, people have been saying, well, we're in the ninth inning. So get ready. Um, how, how do you, right. But so how do you think about, um, you know, being at the end of a business cycle and, you know, how should people prepare, prepare investment wise? 
Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, the, the baseball analogy is an easy one, right? People, and, and you're right, for years people have been saying, oh, we're in the seventh inning or the eighth inning, mm -hmm. and, you know, and this is, you know, how many innings are we going in this game here? Um, I, I would look at Australia as a great example of a country that's been 28, 29 years now of expansion without uh, a recession and say, mm -hmm. well, you know, if we're 12, or sorry, what are we now? We're 11 years into it. What's to say that it won't be 28 years? Uh, I think the challenge that people have is that they see the low interest rate environment, they see the low unemployment, and they try and sort of work out a Phillips curve analysis of, well, inflation, given all the monetary easing that we're seeing, inflation is going to skyrocket and we're going to have big problems. Um, I think what people fail to understand is that the combination of technology and globalization has brought down the cost of just about everything everywhere. You know, I, I, you know, we have a running joke in the office. If you want to know where the cheapest, you know, manufacturing costs are, buy a pair of Nikes and flip up the tongue. You know, <laughs> is it Malaysia? Is it Indonesia? Is it China? Mm -hmm. Is it Vietnam? So I think the combination of technology and globalization has steadily lowered the cost of just about everything. You know, if you talk to stockbrokers who are in their 50s or 60s, they'll tell you back about their early days of doing stock trades for, you know, a 10% commission or $20 stock trades at the discount brokerages. You know, though that pricing structure doesn't exist anymore, right? You've got companies right. introducing zero cost trades, right? You've got companies introducing zero management fee investment solutions. So all of that just means your normal inflationary pressures are greatly muted. Hmm. And then when you talk about long bond yields and, and the cost of money, when you've got a big chunk of the global population into that sort of harvesting phase where they don't really need to make more money, they just need to preserve what they've got, um, that puts tremendous pressure on long bond yields as they just they get purchased and purchased and purchased by this group of people that are growing in size and scale everywhere on the globe and their risk tolerances keep shrinking and shrinking such that they are packed into AAA securities, um, whether it be you know very low risk, low vol equity securities, whether it be preferreds, whether it be long bonds or sovereign bonds. So I think you're, going, you're in an environment where interest rates are going to remain low, global growth is going to remain below its sort of 1950 to 2014 average of 3.8%. Uh, and it's going to make people uneasy and uncomfortable for a long period of time. You know, we all go to school to learn how to fight inflation. Nobody went to school in the last 50, 100 years to learn how to create inflation. So it shouldn't be any surprise we're struggling with it in Europe, in particular in Japan, right? Um, you know, we, you know, so I mean, you, whether it's yield curves or trade wars or whether it's fear of the Fed over tightening or whether it's deteriorating manufacturing's da economic data, I think the current environment has a lot of people uneasy, but when you really look at the state of the economy in terms of employment, in, in terms of propensity to spend, uh, and in terms of productivity and, and actual economic output, we're in a good spot. It's just not what mm. people have historically been accustomed to, and so it makes them uneasy. But mm. the one great thing about human beings, to the detriment of our all physical health, is that we can adjust to just about anything. Right. So I think five or six years from now, people will become accustomed to what is the new norm of lower interest rates, lower inflation, lower cost of money, probably just in time for everything to shift again to a new paradigm. <laughs> right. But for now, what we've experienced for the last 11 years is likely what we're going to experience for the next two or three. Oh. Okay. okay. So we're in the sixth inning. Yeah. We're in the sixth okay. inning. Perfect. There you go. If, if that's what you take from all of that, then sure. But I, 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 think, I think baseball analogies are going to be one casualty of the current economic okay. climate. That, that will have played itself. Um, okay. I, I actually wanted to ask you this, uh, and this is, this is not on the question sheet, but sure. you are our, our first black guest, and I, you know, this probably comes up in, in discussions with you sometimes, but like, you know, very rare, you know, very rare in real estate, very rare in finance. Um, it's just white men like Garrett. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, how do you see that kind of changing? Um, and what were some of the key ways that you got to being a leader in this industry? Um, you know, did, did you notice that you were, yeah. <laughs> you know? I yeah, I noticed. Um, <laughs> So I, I think first and foremost, you, you just you just have to strive to be um, better than everybody in terms of know your knowledge level and your in your work ethic. And it doesn't matter if you're black or white from that standpoint. It's not something you can control really. It's just about 
you know, the effort that you put in, the work that you deliver, and the results that you generate. Right. Now, having said that, um, being black in financial services in Canada is certainly not an advantage. It's certainly not a benefit. Um, so all that really means is you've got to work that much harder. Now, I would argue that other people of color, uh, whether they be brown or, or whatever shade of the spectrum people identify with, um, whether it be a woman or whether it be somebody with a physical disability, they can certainly, res they can certainly relate. Um, and their journey is probably marked by similar milestones and similar challenges. So it's not unique to just somebody who is black. But it just does come down to, if you're not an older white male, there are additional challenges that you have to be successful in this arena. You can either rail against them and allow them to make you really, really angry, or you can accept them and just move on. Uh, I think playing sports at a young age was a huge benefit for me to understanding how to overcome some of that adversity. Right. Um, you know, I played running back, uh, so I loved windy days because you couldn't throw the ball, so you'd have to hand it to me 40 times, mm. right? Mm. Um, having said that, you know, on a rainy, mucky day, you know, it's not the greatest of jobs to have, right? right. Uh, so I, I think, you know, just understanding the need to overcome adversity, you know, I mean, the, the guy who's your lead blocker all day long at every game and is responsible for you getting 100 yards every game uh, twists his ankle showing off for girls. And now you've got somebody else blocking for you who isn't as effective. It's just, you know, the, the ability to overcome adversity, to deal with things that are put in your way, either intentionally or unintentionally. I think playing sports is, is one of those things that has really helped me, and I've embraced that uh, in terms of being a leader at Starlight Capital. Right. Um, but, yeah, I just uh, you, you just have to deal with whatever's put in front of you, and uh, it doesn't matter if you're black or a woman or somebody of co you know, color or, or having a disability. You're just going to have to deal with it. Right. Okay. Okay. That was a good answer because I don't know how I would, you know, I'm not at your level even close, but I don't know how I would answer that question. So mm -hmm. good stuff. Um, Sean, did you have any, do you have any questions? Yeah, I actually do. Um, can you, keeping sort of to the life story part of the thing, you were talking a little bit about buffetology and how that motivated you. And then you sort of skimmed through some probably really rocky zigzag parts of your career. Sure. I just wanted to sort of know, um, at least in that sort of, journey towards real, uh, realizing real estate is sort of your, your passion and, and your love and this is where you're going to be making your mark. I just wanted to know how you sort of realized that, how did you come to that, what opportunities came in front of you to really open that door for you? Yeah, so great question Sean and your zigzag analogy is, is a bang on. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of younger people just assume that you go from this job to this job to this job to this job and then presto you're, you're there. Um, when really uh, the path between A and B where you want to be often takes you on different tangents. The key is to just be moving the ball down the field and you know I love football so I'm going to use football analogies right. It's a very wide field and sometimes you're on the left hash and sometimes you're on the right hash but as long as you're moving the ball down the field you're making progress. Yeah. Um, my own life you're right I skimmed over quite a bit but keep in mind I'm 44 it took me <laughs> it took me 20 some odd years to live that stuff we only have so much time on the podcast but um, you know, it, it really is about first identifying what it is that you want to be. Um, so as much as success as I've had and as much as I've progressed into the position that I'm in right now, I actually feel like I'm behind a number of my peers because they identified what they wanted to do earlier than I did. Um, I still wanted to play football into my 20s, um, whereas other people were already writing level one CFA, were already networking sort of on, on Bay Street. Um, you know, I was doing a completely different, uh, different path uh, up until sort of my early 20s. So, you know, from, from my standpoint, uh, you know, a couple of the jobs that I, that I ended up in didn't exist. You know, I, I think of one role at RBC when I was in a rotational program, uh, there was not a rotation in, uh, in asset management at RBC. And so I created it. I wrote the job description, I presented <laughs> the overview, and, uh, you know, the key there is that they didn't have to pay for me, right? <laughs> So they got a resource, um, they got a valuable resource at no cost, um, and that person was going to come in and create a, and, and, you know, complete a defined task for them that they saw value in. Um, so it's, it's things like that. Um, but you've got to always be making progress towards your goals. You know, there are a number of times, you know, touching them on being a black person on Bay Street, there are a number of times where I would call people Monday and Tuesday and set up, you know, meetings for Wednesdays and Thursdays downtown. And you'd show up and you could see the light drain out of their eyes when they met you and you'd know what that means. 
Um, and you don't want to work for people like that anyway, so that's fine. But what you do want is to be able to move to the next stage. So if you don't have any opportunities, is there somebody who invests money or manages money in a similar fashion who might be looking for someone of my experience and, and, can, and would find what I have valuable? And uh, you know, eventually that networking led me to the opportunity at Century. And the opportunity at Century, quite honestly, was uh, I thought it would be in diversified equities, which is what I wanted, and instead I was stuck with real estate and infrastructure. So it wasn't something that I was pursuing. It was something that I was put into. Um, and so I just, I did the best with what I had. And really what I discovered one day was that nobody else was really focused on real estate per se. That's where I started initially um, with a small little $8 million REIT fund. Uh, and I, I recognize an opportunity to kind of dominate that space, if you will. Um, and so we did, and we grew that fund from eight million to 1.5 billion. At one point, it was the largest um, sector fund in the country. And it was larger than all of its real estate peers combined and doubled. So that is some of the skill and the talent that we were able to assemble on that team. But it was also recognizing that nobody else was really focused on that space. Um, now, there are a few more people focused on real estate and infrastructure these days, so it's a little more challenging, but it's also more fun because we know more and we've been through more and we've seen more. I often say there are two types of portfolio managers in this world, ones who were lead managers before 2008, like myself, and mm. ones who weren't, right, who have become lead portfolio managers now since 2008. And I, I certainly wouldn't want to be one of those portfolio managers. The experience that we gained in 2008, 2009 is invaluable, and I certainly hope that none of my peers gain that knowledge anytime soon again. Great. And uh, one other question as far as sort of uh, uh, the growth, at least in the infrastructure side of things in North America being a little bit more tighter than perhaps 2008. Um, as far as some of the developing nations, uh, Africa, South Asia, uh, you know, obviously GDP growth is through the roof, uh, you know, the quality of life metrics are now slowly increasing. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on, on those geographies for investment, especially from an infrastructure point of view? Yeah, so infrastructure is one of the best ways to get emerging market exposure because um, you've got access to an asset that's usually going to have high utilization with very little competition. Right? So I mean, I'll give you an example. If you think China, the rise of the middle class in China is going to result in you know, consumer discretionary businesses doing very well, right? Auto manufacturers, entertainment businesses, leisure, apparel, that sort of thing. You can do brain damage and try to figure out who the leading Chinese domestic, you know, consumer discretionary businesses are going to be. Um, and I would say that your hit rate is probably going to be sub 50%. Now contrast that with what, say, Brookfield has done in Brazil or in Chile or in Argentina, where they've gone in and they've purchased infrastructure concessions like electricity transmission, like water distribution. It doesn't matter if people are rising from lower class to middle class or middle class to upper class, they're gonna drink water, they're gonna use electricity. So as that country evolves and as GDP per capita increases and as a middle class e emerges, they're still gonna utilize transportation services, you know, electricity and energy transport. And so those are services where there's a resilient built-in demand, and so you'll have more consistency. There's no competition, right? It's not like we have four light switches here and you've got to pick between your electricity provider, right? So those are businesses that are going to have built-in demand, very little competition, if any, regulation that provides consistency and, and, and certainty, and then the last piece that you're missing then is uh, separation of church and state, if you will. Um, do you have a regime where the courts are independent um, where property rights are respected, where capital can move freely in and out of the country, um, where you know, IP rights are respected. So it's wonderful to point to, say, uh, you know, a country like China and say there's tremendous growth there, um, but your ability to actually realize returns in a market like that is constrained by you know, the, uh, the political system, if you will. You really sort of have to, in a way, localize your relationship management, right? Uh, with people and players that have been there and been brought up there, right? So, is there like examples of perhaps, perhaps something that Starlight's doing in that, in that spectrum as far as localizing their relationships so that they can come up with these sort of... Uh... Yeah, I think, I think that's one approach that you can take. The other approach you can take is really to say we're only going to invest in geographies that are similar to our home market, right? So, you know, I, I mean, one of the... You know, it's great for Canadian businesses because the U.S. market is very similar in terms of customs and in terms of structure as the Canadian market. 
higher level of competition and sophistication, but very similar from that standpoint. Then you start looking at uh, countries like the UK, and then, then you really have to start moving to Australia, right? Um, I think if you're a business in France, you know, you've got a built-in sort of ec ecosystem of Germany and Italy and Spain and Portugal that you can expand into, right? If you're in the UK or if you're Ireland, Ireland is very similar to Canada. You can move into the UK, or sorry, into England in this case. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one approach is to sort of take a localized approach and partner with somebody in that market, and that's certainly the approach that China en encourages. I think another approach, if you simply just want to leverage your own skill set, is to move into markets that are more si that are similar to your home market, such that your learning curve isn't quite as steep, and you can understand sort of the customs and expectations in that market. Uh, I would say that if you're a Canadian domestic company, you know the, you're probably going to have greater success expanding into the U.S. versus trying to go directly into India or China or Brazil, if you will. Great, thank you. Interesting. <coughs> I think you should go with the. Final. Yes, the final the question. Final. All right. The best question. The okay. best question. Um, before, actually, before the best question, oh, just okay. right before, uh, is there anything that we should be paying attention to that, that you guys are working on right now? Or is there anything that you want to attract uh, eyeballs from our audience? Mm -hmm. the, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, well, it's October 4 uh, that we're, we're taping this, that, uh, you know, October 2nd was our one-year anniversary. Hmm. And in the capital markets industry, you can't market your performance uh, until your funds are a year old. So for us, it's, uh, it's finally we can go out and tell everyone mm -hmm. what our performance is like. So for us, it's phenomenal on an absolute basis, on a relative basis. But one of the key things that I want to communicate to people 2018 and 2019 have been years where volatility has been reintroduced, right? Equity markets pretty much went straight up in 2017. 2018, you started off high, finished low. In 2019, you started low and, and finished high. Find some wood to knock on. <laughs> um, one of the things that we are most proud of is the fact that we had negative downside capture, meaning that when global equities went down, when U.S. equities went down, when Canadian equities went down, when global real estate went down, when global infrastructure went down, our funds actually went up. And that is a testament to running a concentrated portfolio mm. of great businesses that offer you enough return for the risk you're exposed to. So mm. we would encourage everyone to go to the Starlight Capital website and have a look at sort of the performance we've delivered and the value that we've added through active management with high active share and low downside capture, in our case, negative. I think there's always room in clients' portfolios for that. And then you layer on the fact that we provide people with income and exposure to two asset classes that are underrepresented. I think that's a winning formula for just about anybody. Awesome. Okay. I will be, sorry, Dennis, I will be going there. Um, okay. So this is the last question. It's called the three truths. Uh, you won't find it on there. Sure. Um, so years from now, imagine that uh, Starlight Capital has grown to be this mega monster and, you know, super successful as it already is. Um, but you've achieved everything that you ever wanted to achieve. Oh, wow. And you're, okay. And you're, you know, it's it's a hundred years in the future, but for whatever reason, it's it's your. I years. always keep saying that, but it's late in the future, and and for whatever reason, it's your last day, uh, and your your family and your friends and everybody who love you are around you. Um, all six of them. Okay. All six. All six. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them are there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but for whatever reason, all of the content that you've created on channels like this, on BNN, the books that you've written, they've all been erased. Uh, and you have three short notes where you can you can kind of write to, on to people on how to lead their lives and you know think about life. What would you put on those notes? I think uh, the first one that comes to mind is behave with integrity, right? Um, so understand what is right and, uh, and do your best to kind of always adhere to that path. You're never gonna always be able to do what's right. Um, there are always gonna be conflicting goals, but lead a life with integrity. I think the, uh, the second thing I would say is uh, spend most of your time or as much as your time as you can with your family and your friends and those people who do love you. Um, because this world is not set up to, uh, to love everybody and this world is not set up to provide equal opportunity to everybody. But at the end of the day, if you're surrounded by those people that, uh, that love you and care for you, then you're probably going to be okay. Um, and I think the third thing that I would say is, is probably try to leave a legacy of adding value slash improving the world. And it doesn't mean that all of us have to be on a mission to save the whales. It doesn't mean that all of us have to like volunteer at soup kitchens. But I think uh, it's important that if we're all trying to figure out a way to improve 
one small part of our existence or one small part of the small box that we occupy on this planet. Uh, I think if we're all sort of focused on that, uh, then our collective efforts will probably mean that things will steadily get better, um, you know, as our years progress. Right. Okay. So that's a, that's it. Integrity, family, and imp- improving. That's Those great. Those are great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you being here. Anytime, guys. Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Sean.